The Castlereagh papers at Prony are the papers of Robert Stewart, who was Viscount Castlereagh and was later the second Marquess of Londonderry. The papers cover his entire political career, from about 1797 right up until his death in 1822. They cover all of the high offices that Castlereagh held during this period. So he was the Irish Chief Secretary, he was the President of the Board of Control, he was the Secretary for War in the Colonies, he was Foreign Secretary, he was Leader of the House of Commons, and there was his role in the Congress of Vienna, which concluded the Napoleonic Wars. The core of the Castlereagh Papers is 37 volumes, which comprise 6,217 documents. The papers were arranged and bound in the 1840s as part of a project to publish a selection of Castlereagh's correspondence. And this was a project which was overseen by Castlereagh's half-brother, Charles Vane. Where the published version has long been regarded as definitive, it turns out that sections of the correspondence have been left out, edited, entirely boulderized, and that there is greater emphasis on some parts of Castlereagh's career than on others. One casualty of this editing is his period as the Irish Chief Secretary. The bound volumes themselves remained in the possession of the Stuart family right up until the 20th century. In 1939, they were relocated from Londonderry House in London to the family seat at Mount Stuart in County Down. They were deposited in Prony in 1974. This volume is taken from Castlereagh's time as Irish Chief Secretary, specifically the correspondence of the summer of 1798. In 1797, when Castlereagh was only 27 years old, he was appointed as Acting Chief Secretary. Castlereagh had been an Irish MP since 1790. A member of a highly successful Irish political family, Castlereagh was a calm, level-headed young man, a first-rate debater and an able administrator. He remained in office even when Lord Camden, who appointed him, was replaced by General Cornwallis. He was officially appointed to the post of Chief Secretary at the end of 1798. This was a highly significant appointment. It was the policy of the government that this position should not be held by Irishmen. However, Cornwallis believed that Castlereagh was so unlike an Irishman, I think he has a just claim to an exception in his favour. Predictably, the papers from Castlereagh's time as Chief Secretary are dominated by two major events, the 1798 rebellion and the passing of the Act of Union. This particular volume includes letters and reports about the military campaign, about the trials of rebels, about information received from government informers and agents abroad, about the landing and movements of the French invasion force and the steps taken to resist it. During the chaotic summer of 1798, when a rebellion was raging and one that would kill nearly 20,000 people, some described Castlereagh as the only thing holding together the administration in Dublin Castle. As one correspondent to Lord Downshire put it, we are threatened with an insurrection, probably this very night, if great care is not taken, but we know not who governs, except we look up to Lord Castlereagh. This letter is from James Lanigan, the Catholic Bishop of Ossory, to John Thomas Troy, the Archbishop of Dublin. This is likely to be intercepted mail between two Catholic bishops who were under surveillance. A close correspondent to the Chief Secretary was the Secretary of the Irish Post Office, John Lees, who himself had been an Under Secretary in the Chief Secretary's office. This letter is describing a sermon recently given by a Catholic priest, which was mischievously re misrepresented as being anti-government. It describes how Lanigan preached against radical and republican doctrines, warning the poor people not to be deluded by these monsters. I told them that they should rather lose their lives than take the infernal oath of the United Irishmen. The issue of the Catholic hierarchy encouraging loyalty can be seen in this printed sermon from Troy to the Catholics of Dublin, which decries the influence of Thomas Paine and the French Revolution. In practical speculations on the rights of man and the majesty of the people, on the dignity and independence of the human mind, on the abstract duties of survivors and exaggerated abuses of authority, fatal speculations, disastrous theories, not more subversive of social order and happiness than destructive of every principle of the Christian religion. We bitterly lament 
the fatal consequences of this anti-Christian conspiracy. As this shows, in 1798, the Catholic bishops were not fans of the United Irishmen and republicanism more generally. Here we have a fairly detailed map of the Dublin Castle complex, its various component buildings, but also showing how it could be accessed by nearby Dublin Street. Despite it being a castle, there were real fears that the seat of British government in Ireland might be seized by insurgents. There is an interesting map which shows the Royal Hospital at Kilmainham. It also shows the distance of the hospital from other locations in Dublin. In a further note, there is a description of how there is no location more eligible than the Royal Hospital. Other sites have been suggested as a possible citadel in the case of an invasion or revolution. And these are the Poor House and a military infirmary hospital in Phoenix Park. All have good and bad qualities. Ultimately, it was recommended that the castle would suffice as the castle may be made much more defensible against a mob with little expense. This is a letter from the Prime Minister, William Pitt, to the Lord Lieutenant Camden. It's dated the 13th of July, 1798. So what is Pitt writing to Camden about during the middle of a bloody rebellion in which thousands have been killed? Pitt is writing about the sinking fund and the intricacies of the national finance and debt restructuring. This just goes to show that even during a rebellion, the bills have to be paid. How does this material help to replace lost material from the Public Record Office of Ireland? While all of the Castlereagh material is undoubtedly interesting, just look at the job titles that he held. It is the papers from his time as Irish Chief Secretary which are of particular importance to this project. The Chief Secretary's office was quite simply the most important office in the Irish government. It acted as the means of communication between the government in Westminster and its equivalent departments in the Dublin administration and the branch offices in Ireland. It's an office that was in existence from the 16th century right up until 1922. Herbert Woods' guide to the records contained in the Record Office, which was published in 1919, devotes an entire 18 pages to what would have been the contents of the Chief Secretary's Office papers. It's hard to put across the significance of, of the loss of this material because it touched on every area of historical research, political, economic, social, legal history, public history, everything. The fact this material is no longer there is an awful loss. However, the good news is that the material was not lost in its entirety because we have collections like the Castlereagh papers. It was the custom for high-ranking officials to have their own collections of personal and private papers and there was not a clear distinction between personal and private material. So when an office holder left, he took all of his papers with him. It was for this reason that the State Paper Office created copies. So it was the copies that were sent to the Four Courts to be preserved. When the Four Courts burned down in 1922, it was the copies that were lost. Despite the destruction of 1922, Herbert Wood himself noted, the original documents will still be found in the archives of those noble families whose scions held the great political offices in Ireland. The Castlereagh Papers in Prony is one such example of how this material survives. <laughs>